it, man. You ready to rock? Let's do this, man. The prodigal podcast son has returned. <laughs> My favorite little brother. <laughs> the adopted stepchild of the RRP. The uh, the black sheep. Or I don't know. There's, I don't know. there's competition. The there's competition. Who's there's your me, competition? JJ. Yeah, he's not. <laughs> nah. Well, he's a different kind of black sheep. Yes, he is his own. Uh, he's got the the leader of the black sheep squad. But, um, dude, it's so funny doing this because we always like because we're all, all, both always off doing crazy things and crazy lives. And, uh, and 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 we rarely do the like, you know, oh, how was your day to day? That kind of checking in. Uh-huh. But uh, I'll just show up here randomly. And then if this is like we like lock and load into the chamber, you know. <laughs> well, I don't know what's going to happen here. We don't yeah. have any agenda. There's no, yep. uh, you know, there's no specific subject matter that I feel like we have to cover. I just thought. You're you've been on the show what like six times at this point? I think I think it's six. Yeah, yeah. I think you, you I think you have the record <laughs> appearing <laughs> on the podcast more than anybody else. But at the same time, I don't think you've been on the show for over a year at least. It's been a while. It's yeah, it's been um, maybe a year and a half. Yeah, I think so. I mean, you know, since the book came out. So we're due for a check in. Yes, there's been a lot of terrain that's been covered. Yes, and the beautiful thing is you don't have anything to promote. Yeah, that so was we one can of the speak bros. I that was one of the things is I was like, this is actually a, a, the perfect time to podcast because I have I have no talking points. I have there's nothing that like I want to hit or I I have nothing to plug. I have you know what I mean. I'm not uh-huh. shilling for anything for once, and we can just uh, just throw down, catch up, talk shit, bust each other's balls. And, well, you've like, been doing a lot of stuff, but I, th- I sort of conceptual, I was doing a little bit of thinking like, okay, what, you know, what do I want to cover? Like there should at least be, you know, some overarching theme here. Yeah. And uh, I think that what's interesting about you and, and maybe perhaps in part, um, why people connect with you when you're on the show, because these episodes are always super popular with people is that in certain respects, you're, you're in many ways can like a stand in for the audience. Like I think your life experience or kind of your perspective on a lot of the things that I talk about, yeah. uh, comes from, uh, you know, a shared kind of, kind of viewpoint that a lot of people who listen to this show, uh, harbor or have just in terms of like, okay, how do I like, I like rich. He talks about cool stuff, but like, I don't know if I'm there yet or I don't know how to make this work and I'm still struggling. And you've had an interesting journey with all of these things over the last year. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, I'm a professional struggler. I, <laughs> <laughs> I have, I have all the problems that the people who yeah. listen to your podcast have. And I, uh, that's your I, career. You're yeah. a musician, you're a writer, but, but your vocation is struggling. Yeah. Yeah. I, 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 I excel <laughs> you are at very falling attached. short. No, we talked about this before. Like you're attached to certain, uh, lifestyle habits that yeah. I've always encouraging you to shed and transcend. And you nonetheless persist in hanging on to. It's, I have a hard time. I'm an emotional hoarder. Like I don't, I don't, I, I don't really hoard stuff. What does that mean? But I, I hang on to like feelings and things. You know, I, um, I, I've been struggling with sobriety. I haven't, uh, I haven't relapsed, but I've definitely like, I think about that shit a lot. And, uh, I was talking to a buddy of mine and I was like, man, yeah, you know, every once in a while I just, I like get a Jones where I like, you know, like, I want to go to the bar and do six shots and then go blow a bunch of lines. All right. But hold on a second. Let me, let me give you his response. And and he just looked at me and he was like, you know, that we don't do that anymore. Right. You know, that like you, you quit, but we stopped. We're all 40. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, even if you're not an alcoholic or an addict, like people taper off, people grow up, you know? Right. But and, you, so let me, let's explore that for a second here. So when you have that craving or you feel that like sort of groundswell of, you know, compulsiveness rise up inside of you, uh, you're not acting on it, but what is the, what are the emotions that you experience? Like, do you feel ashamed that you feel that way or you feel like I shouldn't feel this way? And um, how, how long have you been sober at this point? At this point, it's eight. Eight years, eight, eight and years, a half years, right. something like that. So do you feel yeah. like you should have transcended that at this point? Um, yeah, I, I mean, I feel like, um, I, you know, I feel like we're, we're both sort of success stories, you know, and, um, I, I want to close the door on that. And 
that's a pipe dream. You know, you, the, that door is, will always be, it'll, if it's not wide open, it'll be a jar or it'll be a crack or it'll be latched poorly, you know, and like ready to spring back open. Mm-hmm. And I know that I just need to, uh, you know, to live with that. Um, but it is frustrating to, to feel like you're, you've gone so far down the road with sobriety and then to have a, a craving like that. Um, I don't, the, this is, this is the thing. I don't, I've had a million opportunities to drink, you know, I mean, Jesus on this last tour when I was in, you're, the, you're basically living in dive bars. I, I know I so spend more time exactly in, dive. in like a high vibrating environment conducive yeah. to like optimal sobriety. But the point that I'm driving at really that I, that I want to, that I want to get to is this is kind of an, an endemic thing with alcoholics. Like even people who have been sober for a long time, suddenly they have an urge and they feel bad about themselves. Like, I can't believe that I have that urge or that compulsion. Like, haven't I moved past this? But you have to remember that if you're an alcoholic, like you're a true real alcoholic, that is your default state of mind and your condition. So you should just understand that that goes with the territory and it's a little kind of like red flag, like, Oh, maybe I need to take a little contrary action to get back on track. Mm -hmm. But of course you're going to feel that way from time to time. Yeah. You know, the miracle is that you don't act on that. It's like, you're going to have those emotions. You're going to feel that way periodically. It's what you do in response to that, that dictates, you know, life outcomes. And you know, the miracle is that, is not that the alcoholic, you know, the sober alcoholic stays sober. The, you know, the, the mir- is the mir- well, I jumbled my thoughts, but essentially the miracle is that you're not drinking every day. Like you forget that, right? That's your default state. And you've put together eight years without doing that. So you have a craving from time to time. Congratulations. You're an alcoholic. You know, you shouldn't be ashamed of that. It's just a little nudge to say, Hey, maybe I should take a look at whatever is going on with me physically and emotionally that led to that craving so I can, um, you know, maybe shift my behavior or my environment a little bit to nip that in the bud. So that doesn't come up next time. It gets even more interesting, uh, on this last tour in England. Um, I was, uh, I was traveling with this band bird cloud who are, uh, alcohol aficionados. Uh-huh. They, they appreciate the sauce and, uh, and, and they're brilliant musicians and brilliant writers. And it was, a, you know, it was a privilege to tour with them. And also day after day, I was like, uh, and then, uh, you know, towards the end of the tour, we were in London and I had sort of like, you know, after you're on the road for a while, you get used to setting things up a certain way. I put my capo here. I put my slide here. I put mm-hmm. my, you know, my thing of water or seltzer here. And, uh, and then I got up um on stage and great night like sold out room in you know and to be in a foreign country and have people singing your songs back to you i mean that that's like such a fucking that's, great that's feeling the thing yeah and um i went up and i like did my first song reached down grabbed my drink took a swig of it and it was pure vodka and like it's not the first time this has happened to you no, you wrote about that other yeah. time that and but that was a mixed you. vodka drink this was straight vodka which got me th- and i was like did did somebody do this to me on purpose or like what the, but I, I, I like felt it in my mouth and I, I spit it out back into the glass and I did the rest of the set totally cotton mouth, like not drinking anything, you uh-huh. know? And that's weird to have something like that happen in the public eye. And, and then you have to go through the rest of the show. And the whole time I was thinking like, well, I already got a little bit. Why not just, you know, Right. And you also have that millisecond thing where it's in your mouth and it's almost like a, like, what is your knee jerk unconscious reaction? Like swallow or spit. Like it can go, that can go either way. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, and so the whole, and every alcoholic justification was going through my head of like, Oh, I already got a drop down my throat. Mm -hmm. It's already like, you know, it's already tainted or whatever. And, but I never did. I never, I didn't take a drink. I, you know, as soon as I got off stage, I pounded a couple of bottles of water and, that made me realize that the cravings that I've had where I, I like really want to drink, that's not what's going on. I really don't want to drink because I had, I had everything teed up for the perfect excuse where I had accidentally taken a drink and then it would have been so easy. Oh, I'm on tour, like mm-hmm. in a foreign country. I've ever, I had every excuse lined up to justify a good relapse and I didn't do it. And I realize it's because I really don't want to drink. And when I get those cravings about, I really want to drink. I really, you know, it's that I miss being young. 
I miss being 22. I'm having a hard time dealing with aging. Being it's, like a 40 year old man. It's fucking, so it, it's really bumming it's me a out. Romantic, it's a romantic attachment or relationship with a, a bygone era in which you were carousing around Brooklyn and New York, like doing whatever. Yeah, yeah. It, it's, it's, it feels like a time machine in a bottle where I can just have a drink and go back there to being a kid, to hanging out with my friends, to, you know, falling down on the mm-hmm. river or, you know, whatever sh- bullshit we used to do. And, um, you know, I, I posted something where I said, you know, um, I've lost more friends to parenthood than, you know, alcoholism, drug addiction, and suicide combined. Yeah. You know, please RT if this scourge has affected <laughs> you. <laughs> and like, I mean, a smart ass, of course, but it's, it's true, man. Like I, you know, I friend, I, I feel like I'm one of the, one of the last, if not the last of my friends to, uh, to not be married, to not have children. And it, it's, to a point where like, I just, I, I, I had alienated all my friends and now I sort of gotten them back, but then I've lost them again to parenthood. Yeah. And is it, is it parenthood or is it just growing up where the lifestyle choices, the free time entertainment choices have pivoted away from some of your, uh, cherished, most favorite occupations. The, uh, both. I yeah. mean, a lot of it is parenthood. A lot of my friends have, you know, young, you know, two kids under four or something like that. Um, and also people, I, I, the juxtaposition of the words dinner and party always bothered me because I was like, man, it's one or the other. Like, yeah, that's, <laughs> well, for the either, alcoholic, they don't go together, you know, either unless, it's dinner or it's a part, unless you dinner is just a liquid, party? if What's it's a liquid it? dinner, that's yeah. different. Like I, I mean, I remember, God, I remember like we threw some party when I was like 20 living in Colorado and like my uh, roommate's girlfriend made all this like awesome food and everybody was just coked to the gills and hammered. And by the end of the night, almost nothing had been eaten. There was just like cigarettes put out in the like, you know, penne pasta with right. the, and, and just you, heartbreaking. But you, yeah. But you look back on that and that's the good old, that's, yeah, that's yeah. what you miss. Yeah. Right? I, well, I, I remember all the, like the funny shit about it mm-hmm. and the, you know, and the times when we were just like laughing uncontrollably and I miss that, you know, I, I, I'm glossing over the, yeah, the you, next morning. Right. You yeah. Know? You're not, you're not playing it through to its conclusion. Yeah. Right. So what's helpful to me when I start to romanticize the drinking days is to really like you remember those episodes, but then just, okay, what happened after that? And what happened? Oh after yeah. That? And what happened? After, you know, and yeah. then just, and then follow the thread and then you're like, Oh yeah, that's why I don't drink. Yeah. And, and listen, I mean, I, um, I, most of the time I love not drinking. I love, uh, not apologizing for the first half of the next morning to people is so great. Like to get into an argument with somebody and to be able to say, well, actually I remember that I said this and to be able to remember it and not just have to, you know, I mean, that's, that's great. And like, I'm running again. I'm training for a 50 K in uh, December. Like it's going well. Uh-huh. I had like a real strong 20 mile run the other day where I was just like flying. And, um, and I like, you know, I like to like at the end of the night when we're loading out being like, no, I got this, I can drive home or I can take care of this situation, you know, to be, to make a positive contribution, to be in control and stuff. But I, um, for me, my youth is so stitched through with, uh, with alcohol and cough syrup and all the other stupid shit that we used to do, you know, that I think in my brain, that's the, that's become a shorthand, you know, or a, a signal for youth, Mm -hmm. you know, the, um, I, you know, I, I had actively planned to be dead a long time ago. And I, so I, I don't know how to, how to live now or how to have fun or, I mean, I'm starting, I'm starting to figure it out. I'm starting to get an idea, but I don't, I mean, a lot of, uh, I don't know. I feel like a lot of people like after like 38 or 40, they're like, all right, well now, now, now we gain 40 pounds and we Mm -hmm. quit the band and we sell the gear and we, we don't do this anymore. And we don't do that anymore. And we just sort of like, and they just sort of like, um, well, I mean, you know, that, you know, the over the hill, right. That they're just like, all right, now we're just going to coast into, have you seen um, that, uh, TV show on HBO called togetherness that Mark Mark Duplass created? It's, it's like, it, it goes right to the heart of what you just said. Yeah. It's basically like, uh, uh, 
a cast of characters who are all right at that age where they're making that transition from what their life used to be like single to trying to become responsible adults and parents and what gets baked into that. I think you would, I think you would relate to it. Oh, I got to check it out. Yeah, You should check it out. It's cool. But here's the thing, man. I mean, I, you know, I couldn't do what you're doing. I mean, you spend an inordinate amount of time in like, you know, dive bars, touring, you know, on the road and, and hanging out with, you know, people that, that are drinking a lot and doing that, you know, living that kind of lifestyle. Yeah. I, I mean, that would wear me down. It, it, it does wear me down. I mean, it, it, it does tire me out. Um, but I realized that from the experience I had of like getting sober and then three weeks later going to work in a bar and having to work in a bar and stay sober that, you know, I think, um, alcoholics in early sobriety, they have to build the, the castle or the fortress or the, the barricades in their outside mm. life that you don't step into a bar. You don't hang out with those people anymore. You don't, you know, right. um, and, um, and I, and I think that that's absolutely the right thing to do. Um, but I couldn't do that. So I, I had to build that barricade in my head. And, um, and I think the risk of failure is really high when you're, when you're doing that. And I mean, there, there's a reason that my story is interesting is because most people who try and do what I did don't, it doesn't work. But now at this point, I, I have that shit in my head, you know? And, and when I tasted that vodka in my mouth, I mean, it, it tasted awesome. You know, I was like, vodka. Ah, I love okay. you. Where have you been? You know? And also I was like, you don't do that anymore. And, and it was just a gut reaction of like, no, spit it out. That's mm -hmm. not, you know, and like my body can finally recognize. No, that is poison, dude. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you, you went to, you went to great pains to get that in the past, but it is poison. It is actually, you know, there's an adage in sobriety that, you know, if you're truly sober, you can go anywhere. Like you shouldn't, you shouldn't, you, you shouldn't have to avoid, you know, this place or that place because it might trigger you in a certain way. Um, but that there has to be kind of a purpose for wandering into a location that you might imperil the, you know, the solidity of, of your, of your sober program. And what always mystifies me is that you do this alone. Like I can't do it alone. I need other people. I need, yeah. you know, I need the secret society and everything that comes with that to stay sober. And I know what it's like to step outside that. And I've done so at my peril and it hasn't worked out. So, you know, well, I, I stay close, but like you're, you, you still are holding on to this sort of self will run self styled <laughs> approach to sobriety. And I have no judgment on that. It's you're, you're eight years sober, man. Like that's amazing. But it's, it's curious to me how you're able to do that, especially when your lifestyle, you know, finds you in all kinds of locations that mm -hmm. aren't conducive to the highest vibration. Rich, <laughs> know that you're with me everywhere I go. <laughs> okay. I mean, yeah. that I, if you're not there, you're still there. You know, you and a couple other friends are like definitely people who I carry on my shoulder, in my head, you know, with me wherever I go, you know, so that, cause I have moments of weakness and I have moments, and I definitely have moments of, uh, nihilism, you know, where it's like my nihilism is in, uh, it's in regression, but it mm -hmm. could easily come back, you know, and, um, I just think that, um, you know, that's not the life that you would want for me. You would be worried. You would be concerned um, that, you know, I mean, there's a lot of things that it, it would, you know, I mean, I, listen, I, I know at this point that there, I, I can't, I couldn't alienate you as a friend if I tried, but I know too, that if I started drinking, that it would be really hard for us to be friends, mm -hmm. you know? And um, so I, you know, and I have other, I have other friends like that, you know, but um, so I don't go into these places alone. I, I bring, I, I bring you and a couple other people with me, but um, one, I think one of the things that, that made me sort of bail out of running and the ultra community and stuff like that mm -hmm. is I felt like, um, you know, one of the things I love about, about Dave Clark and I love about you is that, um, that, um, the, the journey you travel, um, on your feet is less important than the journey you travel, the, the distance you cover in your head, you know, and, and that it, it was about, you know, going out there and like, you know, um, 
having an experience like a vision quest or something like that, you mm-hmm. know, the end. Um, and then, you know, sort of doing these races and, and interacting with people, you know, for them, it just seemed sort of like, uh, um, boot camp or cardio exercise or, you know, um, and I would get into conversations with you mean people. in the ultra community. Yeah. Cause I think there's a lot of seekers there, you know, there are, there there's are, a lot of people in recovery for sure. Well, yes, you know? absolutely. And, and also, you know, what I was seeing may not be what was accurate. I may have been looking for debt dissatisfaction and then I found right. it. You yeah. Know? You have to, you have to filter that through your own yeah. prism of perception, yeah, whatever the opposite of rose colored glasses are <laughs> yeah, through, through whatever goggles Mishka is <laughs> like, wearing, uh, like wet yeah. welders shades. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Everything the, is terrible. <laughs> Everybody's out to get me. The, uh, that's, that's true. <laughs> I was like, that's, oh, wait, that's right. That, um, you finally see my, uh, <laughs> see how I feel. No, the, um, you know, so I, there, you know, and, and a lot of times I would find myself in these sort of like hitchhiker conversations, you know, like that when you're hitchhiking, if, if somebody says, um, oh man, I'm glad we finally got Trump in the in office. He's doing a great job. You would be like, yep. Uh-huh. And look at the beautiful day that we're having, mm-hmm. you know, because when you're hitchhiking, you're at somebody else's. Um, they're helping you out. You're not going to get into a protracted conversation with them about religion or politics or gun control or whatever the hot button issues are. You're just going to toe the line. You're just going to surf along, you know, and then I would find myself getting into these conversations with people on the trails or whatever, where, you know, Oh, I prefer this kind of gel or whatever. And I was like, man, this is fucking boring me to death. Mm -hmm. And, and I felt that, and I, and in hindsight, I know that this is wrong, but this is one of the things that led me to the current, uh, empire strikes back phase that I'm going through, which is that I felt that it was time for me to move into like a life of the mind. And that I really wanted to be writing more, to be creating more, to have new experiences, to, to, uh, to reinvent myself as an artist and mm-hmm. as a musician and, um, make shit and produce stuff. And I, you know, I felt like, um, you know, I was, I, I was boxing and I was kickboxing and I was going to the gym and, and stuff like that. And that just seemed like, um, it seemed like a waste of time and mm-hmm. in hindsight, it absolutely wasn't, but sometimes you have to leave the trail in order to be able to look back and be like, Oh, that's where the trail was right there. That's where I left it. Right. I mean, well, I've always seen you as somebody who, you know, and this is clear in your writing, like you took up ultra running, not because you were just going to become a career ultra runner. This is, this was a, an attempt to get out of your comfort zone and really, you know, shake things up in your life to, you know, reframe your perspective and, 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 you know, recreate new habits that could set you on a new trajectory. And I think it did that. Right. So, so there's something to be said for, it's not that like, Oh, you walked away from it. So it's a defeatist thing. Like, okay, what's the next thing that's out of my comfort zone. That's going to challenge me in a new way. Once it stops sort of pressing you, you know, pressing the outer boundaries of, of your envelope, uh, it's time to look in other areas, perhaps. I mean, there's always, you know, I talked about this with David Clark and I'm sure you have as well. Like he kept pushing and pushing and pushing. It's like, dude, you know, at what point does it tip over into its own form of addiction and compulsion and obsession? Because yeah. there's always going to be a crazier thing that you can do. And like, what are you actually trying to learn about yourself? Yeah. And yeah. when does it become, you know, the enemy of the thing that you aspire for yourself? Yeah. The, and that's, you know, the, um, craving new things, craving new sensations, that's learning, that's curiosity, that's to be encouraged, you know, and expanding your realm of knowledge and putting yourself, you know, outside of your comfort zone. That's great. But also craving new things and new experiences is how I got into trouble with drugs and alcohol. And, um, and also you can't spend your whole life questing for the new, looking for the new thrill. You know, sometimes you, you have to reach a point where you say, enough's enough. This is, you know, I, I, I got there, but there's a distinction between chasing the thrill or trying to get high or trying to escape your reality versus putting yourself in a position to fail and grow as a learning experience for yourself. And sometimes I think those lines get blurred because they can, it's all in your relationship to them that will define whether it's one or the other. Yeah. Um, and so it, it, it requires a certain level of awareness to make sure that your, that your motivations are true and that you're not using it to escape or 
to numb or to, you know, basically truncate your growth as opposed to uh, amplify it. Yeah, I, I think that you and I both have the tendency to divide things into these are the things that I can do and these are the things that I can't do. And then every time um, you move something from one category of the thing I can't do into the category that I can do, then suddenly it loses meaning. It loses. Well, well yeah. I, can, I can do that. It doesn't that, it, that doesn't mean anything. You know, but right, what but about the things through, that I can't do? I think do? that's a little bit through your prism. You know, yes. like I had, I had this woman, Gretchen mm-hmm. Rubin on the podcast who wrote a book called the four tendencies. And she basically through extensive study to her, her, her thesis is that all human beings can be uh, divided into one of four categories in terms of how they respond to external and internal uh, expectations. Uh-huh. And one of the categories is rebel, which is basically the person who doesn't like to be told, you know, when they have to show up or and they want to be, they want to make that decision for themselves. And I, I, I could say without you having to take the quiz that would determine <laughs> which so one tell you me, would fall Tell me into, the other three categories I, think, I uh, want to pick. No, <laughs> you're, you're, you're clearly a rebel, right? So the minute it starts becoming institutionalized let's say ultra running or whatever like oh this it becomes sort of an identity identity defining thing i can see you as being somebody who's going to push up against that and then move in the other direction yeah because you don't want to be boxed into a corner in that way yeah and 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 i will jeopardize my own wellness just to not be in a box or I, I'll, I'll do damage to myself right just because you need because you have this incredible urge to say fuck you yeah, yeah, you know? I do. And it's, that's, that is like my <laughs> yeah. deep, it's like I have it on the back of my eyelids, man. And it's just, it's so hard. You know, I mean, it's, um, it's not always bad. You know, I mean, with, uh, with my sister and with, and with her two daughters, that's one of the things that I work with on mm-hmm. them is to know when to say, fuck you and like stand up for yourself and say, no, I, this is where I draw the line. I'm not going to stand for this. I'm not going to put up with this. You know, this is not, this is not okay. But fuck you can't be your mantra. It can't be your default. You can't just do that all the time, you know, and I knee jerk to it so quickly all the time and, uh, I'm trying to overcome it and it's hard, you know, but, um, but yeah, I mean the, you know, I said, I was thinking about this, you know, as soon as something becomes a hashtag, it's over, Yeah. you know, and like. <laughs> Well, it is. But what do you do when everything's hashtag? Well, that's that, that is where we are right now. Right. Well, that's when you need to revisit your. You know, you know. I also say like you know anything uh, you know short enough to put in a tweet is oversimplification. You know, and that's short enough to put in a tweet. You know, so like right. it's um, you know. But if if you look, but but I'm wrong. You know, and I guess that's that's my point is I, I'm wrong when I say that that you know the Me Too hashtag. That was, that was incredibly meaningful. That was like mm-hmm. such a weird couple of days on social media where every woman that I knew was telling stories of how they'd been sexually harassed, abused, assaulted. And I knew that it was pervasive and I knew that it was everywhere. And I did not know that it was like nearly universal. Mm-hmm. And, and, and more than that, you know, the, that that was the kind of, and the, um, the repetitive, you know, and a lot of my male friends have been assaulted as well. Um, but the, the real eye opening thing for me with, with that me too hashtag was how, um, it was almost every woman ever everywhere. Right. And everybody has a story nonstop all the time, like this constant barrage of harassment and, uh, and, you know, and serial abuse and stuff like that. So the ability of social media to kind of galvanize and organize that, you know, that thought experiment was unbelievably powerful yeah. and the ripple effects of that, you know, culturally are massive. Like I, th- I read just today that the Condé Nast, uh, family of magazines is no longer going to work with Terry Richardson. That Did is so, that? so long because overdue. that's another that like is, uh, open secret. About, yeah. Yeah. Among, well, I mean, I, you know. I can't believe that, that that guy hasn't been like run out of the country, you know what I mean? Cause like people in New York knew about that 10 years ago, but people in Hollywood knew about Harvey Weinstein, mm-hmm. 20 years ago, you know, and that's, and that's the thing is that it, it seems like, um, despicable male behavior is like this universal open secret. That's just sort of like, 
Um, and that, that was an interesting thing well, for me. Because when it's merged with power, then it creates yeah. fear and it becomes institutionalized. And it's amazing how, how it can be perpetuated for so long. But I feel like, you know, we live in a transparent age and that stuff doesn't fly anymore. And things get rooted out with, yeah. with you know, extreme rapidity. It was, it was so interesting to, for me to measure my own response to, you know, to reading all these stories and then to engage with, uh, my female friends who are sort of like, yeah, we told you, mm-hmm. you know, not, none of that, none of them were surprised by the, you know, millions and millions of stories right. and, you know, the, the prominent women, you know, the politicians, actors, you know, um, who had been, who had endured that. And nearly all of my male friends were like, holy shit, mm-hmm. you know? And it was just, um, I mean, I feel like it was a watershed moment. Um, yeah. Julie has crazy stories. I mean, oh, she, yeah. she jumped in and, and shared a little bit, but you know, she's told me over the years, some banana stories of guys that she worked with in and worked for worked underneath in the garment industry. And it's appalling. Yeah. But you said earlier, you dropped this little bomb. You said you're in your empire strikes back phase. Like, what does that mean? Um, so I got, uh, earlier this year I turned 40, Mm -hmm. uh, which is, colossal bummer as you know life ends at 40 come on man that's when my life started (laughs) i know i know (laughs) and um and i was i had been feeling not just depressed i mean i usually feel a little depressed but like just fucking run down you know and like felt like i was going to sort of float away from the earth at any moment and uh and i was like okay i gotta go to the doctor and just like it's time. You need to you physically know. run down. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, the, uh, so the doctor did all the blood work and stuff and, um, the, uh, you know, he went down my sort of test results and he was like, you well, your, your blood sugar is high. Um, you're, I mean, you're pre diabetic and this is a month after my godfather, um, my uncle, uh, died of diabetes, mm. you know, complications from diabetes. And most of my family is diabetic. And, uh, and I knew that it was sort of waiting in the wings for me, but I thought I had like another 10 years, you mm-hmm. know? And, um, and he was like, uh, you have the testosterone of a 70 year old man. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and I mean, he was like gruff Polish doctor in Greenpoint, And I was like, the doctor, like, you know, my girlfriend's really young and hot. And he was like, you want me to cry for you? <laughs> Just That's like, what he said. Yes. Only you would like retort to your doctor after being delivered that news by describing your girlfriend to him. I, 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 I can't turn it off, man. I, um, so that's pretty heavy, 40. And, you know, you're not like, I mean, you're a big guy. You're carrying a little extra weight around, but like, it's not like you were like obese or anything like that. Eight years sober. I'm sure this was not. And, and, and six time RRP guest, <laughs> you know, I know, and despite I know, I all like, the influence and all the meals that you've had here and all the time that we've spent together. <clears throat> yeah. It took that for you to, to shake you up. And, it, and well, it, it takes what it takes, man. It's like it, you know, when the pain or the news is dire enough, then you wake up. I, I come from the addict school of learning, which is don't learn anything until you're in maximum pain and terror <laughs> yeah. and then be like, okay, I give up. <laughs> All right. I'm in. <laughs> Meanwhile, up until that point, exploit every, uh, yes. opportunity yes. to Twizzler, do your own. Twizzlers for yes. dinner, Red Bull for breakfast. Yeah. Just yeah. stupid shit. Well, stupid, I mean, you stupid. had this for a while there. I haven't seen it lately, but for a while there, you would pride yourself on your Instagram posts of your dinner, which would be like a, a, a can of of beans like you know like you and a can opener sitting on the floor i, I still do that sometimes. yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, they're beans be- are better so quality bad. beans at now. least it's yeah. not like you know yeah. i don't know some terrible chili Mar- or marshmallow like fluff or yeah. something like that yeah. so all right well blood sugar high pre-diabetic like how how pre-diabetic um well that's the thing is that it's you know it's just the one-time you know test mm-hmm. which um 
you know, it sort of me- measures your fasting blood sugar at that point, but it, it doesn't give you a, you know, relative to time. Um, but I, I did the test twice and both times I tested high. I mean, I think one time it was 110 and then the other time it was whatever, 119, mm-hmm. which is, which is borderline, which is right on the border. But I was already having physical effects from it. Like what? Uh, my hands would get like blotchy and itchy and I could, I could sort of tell when, when I was having like a high blood sugar episode and, um, and I started getting, uh, like, um, pins and needles in my legs and stuff. Mm-hmm. And I was like, really this quickly? But, um, I, I did the 23 and me genetic testing and it told me the two things that I already knew, which is that I, f- physically I'm basically bulletproof except for super elevated risk for diabetes and uh, late life dementia, which is those two issues are rampant throughout my family. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, I talked to my sister and I talked to a couple of, you know, other people and like read a sort of, and of course I was leaving on tour the next day. So it wasn't, it's just like, we're going to give you terrible news that you can't really do anything about or learn anything about two days before you leave to go on another month long European tour. Uh-huh. And um, so I read as much as I could and, and, um, did what I thought was the right thing when I was on tour and like, you know, and it made no difference, you know, what was that? What did you do exactly? Um, I, you know, I mean, I, I, I tried not to eat sugar, you know, which was, um, which I was, I mean, that is my, that is my poison of choice, man, but you know, over and above anything else. And, um, you know, and I tried to eat less, but I, I didn't really know what I was doing. And, um, and then when I came back, I, um, I was at Yale and I was like, okay, I'm just going, I'm going to avoid all sort of like refined carbs and, uh, and sugar and that's going to do it. And so I was, you know, eating eggs for breakfast and, you know, chicken salad for lunch and, you know, pork chops and whatever, you know, for dinner. And, uh, and I, I packed on more weight mm-hmm. and, um, and my blood sugar wouldn't go down. Mm-hmm. And then. I was like, fuck it. Like, you know, I, t- I called, uh, I called Dave Clark, shout out to Dave Clark for taking my call. And when I was miserable and terrified and I was like, what do I do? Like, you know, and, uh, Dave was like, he was like, I would, you know, I don't want to preach. I would never preach, but since you're asking <laughs> plant-based is the way to go, that will, that will fix you right up. And, um, and he was right. You know, when I went back to, uh, when I ba- went back to Atlanta, I went like real hardcore of just, um, so, but first of all, <sighs> after, after Yale and, and you trying to avoid all the sugars and the refined carbs, did you do your blood work again? And it was the same. Uh, I, no, I didn't, um, I didn't re- really have like time or an op- or no, I, you know, I did, I went on, uh, I went on Amazon. I bought one of those little like pinprick, you know, blood test things. Mm-hmm. And I would test it every morning after, you know, fasting and, and, uh, five times out of six, it would be high and sometimes really high. And I couldn't like figure out what it was. And then, um, when I got back to Atlanta and I was settled, I just did, um, like plant-based with no fruits, no, um, no grains, sort of no refined anything, just sort of, um, just greens and vegetables. And, um, that's pretty dull for a couple of days. And, uh, but I did, I think I did it for a week or two weeks or 10 days or two weeks. And then finally I had a normal reading and then I had another one and then I, it started being Balancing a out. string of normal readings. And that's um, amazing in two weeks. Yeah. You were able to rectify it. Yep. And then, um, I did it for, I don't know. 40 days, 60 days, something like that before I went back out on the road again, mm-hmm. lost 15 pounds without trying and stopped testing my blood sugar in the morning because what was the point right, when it's, it's good. normal every time? Yeah. I would also suggest you listen to my podcast with Dr. Neil Bernard, uh, which was all about that. Which, uh, which book did he write? Prevent and Reverse Diabetes. Yes, I have that book. You have that book. I have good. that book. I bought that book. Yeah. Uh, I haven't, I haven't read it all yet, but I have that and I have, uh, how not to die. Right. That's a good one. Yeah. And, um, yeah, dude, you're never going to believe this, but I've been doing everything wrong. (laughs) Why didn't you tell me? I can't, I can't, I don't, I don't know what to tell you, man. 
you had to figure it out for yourself. It's like telling a telling a drunk they have to get sober. Like they're not going to hear it until they're ready to get sober. Man. Yeah, it's like telling so a kid not Julie to touch could the hot whip stuff. up the most amazing meals for you time and time yeah. again. But until you're ready to kind of like look at it, or your back is up against the wall. But I'm glad you made that leap, man. Yeah, I would listen to that podcast. I would read both of those books. I'm not sure that you need to remove fruit from your diet. I think you're probably okay with that. Yeah, um, I I I. I brought fruit back in mm-hmm. after once I'd sort of gotten it normal and then it didn't affect my, right. my blood sugar at all. Um, I mean, I don't do dried fruit or something, you know, yeah. like, cause it's easy to sit down with a bag of dried cherries or something like that. No, 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 Real, and, you know, fresh, preferably yes. organic fruit. Yes. Um, but so you've been me, doing this. Well, let me for, as I am the sort of every man listener, let me say this, that it was hard. It, it wasn't an easy transition, but it was absolutely worth it. You know, so like I would say if if somebody's on the cusp of trying it or if they tried it and failed, try it again and then try it again and then try it again because it's totally worth it. And I really, really struggled with it. But now I like I got my mind right, you mm-hmm. know, and I like I love having my oatmeal with stevia in the morning and i i'm i'm like i make killer lentil dishes and like you know what i mean i know i, I do the knot wings the like sliced cauliflower prepared like yeah. hot wings and stuff and like yeah i have a couple of good recipes i can't now. even like believe that you're telling me this is like blowing my mind dude so, I, yeah, you know but like I think i'll it's, hip you to a bunch of cool recipes man i should do like a right you know a, well, you should be, you know yeah cookbook. you're gonna do a cook you're gonna have a cooking show now on youtube but like let's walk through that because i think in certain respects like we said at the outset and you just reminded me like you are a stand-in for a lot of people that i think struggle with this transition and i think it is important to acknowledge that yeah it's hard you have to step out of your comfort zone you have to be willing to like weather a little bit of of discomfort to get to the other side. Like, it's not like, Oh, you snap your fingers and everything's easy. I know that's the culture that we all want for ourselves. But if you've been eating a certain way your entire life, and then you're faced with the prospect of throwing all that out the window and doing something entirely new, it's going to be uncomfortable. It just is. So rather than trying to find a way to not make it uncomfortable, I mean, sure you want, there's ways of, of, you know, sort of cushioning that fall, but but understand that that's okay. But if you can get through like two weeks of trying to figure it out for yourself, like on the other end of that is freedom. So stop yeah. fighting the idea that maybe you're going to be uncomfortable and just accept that perhaps that's going to be part of that journey. Yeah. Yeah. There's, I mean, you know, there's, there's no, nothing worthwhile that you, you know, that you get for free except maybe like sunshine, you know what I mean? Like you have to work for good things and, um, it, uh, yeah, I mean, it was definitely, um, it's definitely challenging. I mean, there were days where I, I would feel sort of like, uh, bloated or lightheaded or no energy or headachey and stuff like that. And, and do you think uh, that's because your body's trying to acclimate to a new way or because you weren't doing it right or you were, you were, you weren't eating enough calories, like looking back on it, like doing a forensic. I think, I think there's, you know, a bunch, a a bunch of different things. I mean, one thing is just, you know, you're radically, you know, in my case, I was radically transforming what I was putting in my body. Right. So what were you eating before? Well, you kind of mentioned it a little bit. Garbage. Yeah. Uh, Pork chops. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, particularly when you're on tour in England, not really an area known for its cuisine or commitment to fresh vegetables (laughs) and stuff like that. And then also just road food. You stop at the gas station, you like, you know what I mean? You sort of get, and even if you're trying to eat healthy, if you get the like trail mix pack, you, your, your body is, your body is an animal. So you grab the trail mix pack that has the M and M's in it. And it has like tons of that super sugary dried fruit. That's, you know, like one step away from candy. Mm -hmm. Um, so, uh, you know, I mean, I would eat like whatever was at, you know, um, a raisin bran with the like super sugary raisins, you know, that was at the continental breakfast at the hotel for, you know, for breakfast, uh, coffee with, you know, sugar and cream in it. And then lunch is, um, whatever, something at the gas station, a pack of gummy worms trail mix. Right. If I'm feeling particularly, uh, but were you hitting uh, drive throughs too? Oh, you going to yeah, McDonald's dude. and yeah, you know, yeah. Hardee's and yeah, Wendy's and stuff road. like that. Yeah. Uh-huh. So out on the road with my friend, star yeah. Anna, who I love and she and I would just bring the worst out of each other and just uh-huh. like, 
um, smoking cigarettes, drinking Red Bull. Oh, man. Come yeah. on, dude. You're killing me. It's so stupid. And I'm paying the price, man. I'm, you know, it, it terrified me and it, you know, it really depressed me to, um, to get that news from, you know, from the doctor. And, um, one, one of the things I'll say too, is that like, um, there is all, there's all this sort of wave of stigma around being, being vegan. You know, I, I have a, a bit in, uh, in my sort of like comedy stuff that I do where I say, you know, vegan, you know, I, I treat it like the N word. I can only say it when I'm, uh, when I'm quoting a self-righteous close-minded shithead or, uh, singing along with Kanye. <laughs> Come on, man. <laughs> Which is Am no, I listen, in that category. This is, no, dude, are you kidding? Come on. No, but this is the thing is that when somebody, if you're trying to make a change for the positive in your life and somebody's like, ha ha vegan, mm-hmm. that's where you take a lesson from me and say, fuck you. Mm-hmm. that's where that's where that comes in handy you know is is um it's my body it's not yours shut up right you know this is a decision that i've made this and- is an amazing development in the life <laughs> shibali i have to say i'm super proud of you I, I wasn't sure this day would come i'm glad that it's here and it's- this is fascinating but i think you know one thing that i think is interesting and, and i want to hear your take on this is that as an addict alcoholic in recovery Whether you're doing that in the context of a structured program or more from a freewheeling approach like yourself, uh, there are certain rules that you erect to orient your life around. And and those rules cannot be broken. And if you're an alcoholic, it means you don't drink. That's Mm -hmm. just no matter what, you don't drink, right? You don't step over that line. That's a non-negotiable thing. And that rule can be very easily applied to diet. You just say, I don't eat you know, this, I don't eat, I don't eat animal products. I don't eat, you know, candy or whatever it is. Like you can Mm. erect a couple very, you don't overcomplicate it. It doesn't have to be like, you know, there doesn't have to be 20 corollaries to every rule. But like, if you just have like two or three rules and like, this is, this is like the marching, you know, this is the marching rule for my life. It removes a lot of decision fatigue. And because you have experience with that in other areas of your life, I found that it's easy to adhere to that because yeah. you ha- that muscle has been flexed and is developed. So do you think about it in that context? You can just say like, well, I'm, you can even say like, look, I'm addicted to drive through or I'm, addi- you know, you know, like, I just can't have that in my life. That does not mm-hmm. serve me. I don't do that anymore. That's not who I am. Yeah. I, um, I think human beings have a tendency to take a lot of like subtle nuanced decisions and make it into a binary thing. And that's oftentimes bad. But in this instance, I think it, I think that's absolutely the way to go is just, you know, like I, I don't drink anymore. I don't, I don't murder people. I don't, you know what I mean? (laughs) You know, there are things that I don't do, you know, and, and drinking is one of them. And, um, and yeah, also now it's, you know, no animal products and, particularly for me, no processed food, Mm -hmm. you know, every once in a while, like, well, like, Oh, I'm going to get pasta and I can feel it the next day, man. Just like, I don't, I don't feel right. It's, it's awesome. And it's delicious. And I love it. You know, and like I can house a huge bowl of pasta and I wake up the next day feeling like uh, I can, I can tell from the way my body feels that that was not what I should have eaten last Mm -hmm. night. And what has your experience been with, with cravings? Like, is that analogous to drugs and alcohol? Have you noticed a a shift? Like, have the cravings for those crazy foods waned? Do you still live with those? And how do you confront and combat that? Um, In the same way that now my body recognizes that alcohol is a poison. You know, if I, you know, putting, you know, gummy worms in my mouth, I'm like, this isn't food. (laughs) You know, like, you can sort of recognize that. And I can tell when... um, there it's like there's no way for me to not be honest with myself anymore you know now i i just know that like um this is uh this is gonna make me feel like shit tomorrow or it's gonna make me feel feel like shit in 15 minutes you know or i'm eating the right thing i'm gonna feel better dude i'm running better Mm -hmm. did you know this if you eat a plant-based diet you actually perform and recover (laughs) better not know that mishka (laughs) i'm so it's such a pleasure for me to be here today to drop this knowledge (laughs) on you wow i'm gonna really have to explore that in my life 
you should read a book on it or something. telling you that yeah, i should write a book about that uh i'm glad that you're finally did you think that i was just bsing or did you no what, no i the whole time that i was or not the whole time I was drinking for most of the time that I was drinking, I knew that I was wrong. Mm -hmm. I knew that I was doing the wrong thing. And I knew that, that, and I think I understood that I would have to quit one day or that it, you know, that it would kill me. Um, and I don't know how, how honest I was with myself about it because, but when I quit drinking, I was like, I quit drinking and people were like, oh, you've quit drinking a million times. And I said, no, no, no. If you think about it, I've taken a break a ton of times. I've said, I'm not drinking for a week or I'm not drinking for a month or even I'm not drinking for a year. But I've always put an end date on it. Now I'm telling you, I quit drinking. You know? And um, the... So yeah, that those those skills you develop as a sober alcoholic have been, you know, have been super helpful in you know, in making this transition. And also the, this is the other thing too, of like, try every day, you know, like i I screw up sometimes, particularly on the road, it's hard. And like, I still have a hard time being that guy who's like, mm -hmm. I don't eat that. You know, I exercise the health cop out as, as often as possible, which is to say, I can't eat that. Mm -hmm. Um, because I still, I, I still approach, you know, virtually everything in my life at, you know, from, uh, a financial capital um, a perspective, you know, that like I, um, you know, my parents always said, don't let food go to waste. And like, this is what we have for dinner. You eat your dinner, you know, and that kind of thing. Um, but, um, but, you know, you can use whatever, you know, in the same way that, you know, with quitting drinking, you can say like, oh, I have to drive or I'm working tonight, you know, and, and that was really helpful for me in the early days of, you know, like, oh, I'm on the clock. I, I have to drive tonight or oh, I'm, I'm feeling sick. I, you know, I, I got to get over this. What you're saying, I mean, between mm -hmm. the lines here is it's less about you adhering to the commitment you made to yourself and versus navigating tricky social situations and having to explain yourself to others and yeah. the pressure that comes with being in an environment where perhaps people are going to be less understanding of the choice that you're making. Yeah. Yeah. I've, I've seen the light and like, you, you know, me, man, I wouldn't like, um, if it was something I was exploring or something I was trying, you know, I, I wouldn't come out and say it in this form that like that I'm doing it, but, uh, but I'm doing it. You know, and I and I've been doing it for a while. You know, and I've how been, long, so how long has it been? I mean, it's been what day is it today? <laughs> what month October, is it? October, late it's, October. It's uh, you know, three or four months. Wow. Um, you know, I've screwed up a couple of times. Um, everybody does. Though, yeah, it's hard, you know? like on the road and stuff like that. Um, I struggle on the road. You know, on the road sometimes it ends up being closer to vegetarian than vegan. But I, whenever possible, I try to. And it's also it's one of those things where I say, you know, I've told myself you can't be your what you're doing is admirable. You can't beat yourself up for falling short on it someday because there was nothing else to eat or you were just starving or whatever. You know, but um, but if I screw up, it's like you know, I'll eat a piece of cheese pizza with vegetables on it. It's not like, oh, well, I screwed up, so, so I'm going to go, I'm going to hit Wendy's. Sizzler or, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Um, <laughs> let's, uh, we should talk about the testosterone thing too. But let, before we get to that, I do want to talk about that. Yeah. Um, I'm interested in, in exploring the relationship between like food and emotions in the sense that when you get sober, you become more aware of, of the extent to which you medicate your emotional state through using or checking out in various yeah. ways. So have you had any, you know, discoveries or epiphanies about, about how you used food in the same way or no? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, I, um, you're never going to believe this, but I found out that I'm a really like reward based. <laughs> Why well, are you laughing? Uh -huh. <laughs> I, you know, that I'm, I'm, a, I'm, I, I, you know, I've, I'm like the rat that's been in the cage for too long that like, I'm not going to do anything unless I know that there's a treat at the end. Mm -hmm. You know, there's got to be some reward. I'll only, I, I will never press the lever just, just for kicks. You know, there's got to be like, if I do this, then I can have that. If I do this, then I can have that, that kind of thing. And, um, 
and, you know, and then I'm starting to realize that like, and, 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 and I've, and this is, you know, one of the ways in which I sort of like ruined running for myself and I ruined a lot of things for myself, which is that like, it's a great privilege that I have that I'm able to write. I should, that should be its own reward. I should just write and then re, re you know, read what I wrote and say, mm-hmm. oh, that's good. There's an interesting part there. That's a good line. That's a good sentence. I was like, yeah, oh, that's a funny part. That should be enough of a reward. I should go out for a run and, and be like, mm-hmm. oh yeah, it was nice. I saw some squirrels. There was that weird snake, whatever, you know, like, and that should be the reward. There doesn't need to be a chocolate bar waiting for me at the end. Right. You know? I'll do this run and then I'll reward myself with a double cheeseburger or whatever. Which completely right. undoes the yeah. <laughs> any good that, yeah. you know, that the run does for you. But it has, uh, it has helped you running. Oh, absolutely, dude. Yeah. One of the things that where, I... Where are you getting your protein, dude? <laughs> How is this happening? The, uh, there's this... I'm in a weird parallel universe right now. Like I'm trying <laughs> know, to understand like what's happening. Freaky Friday. <laughs> I'm glad I didn't... We, I'm glad we didn't go... <laughs> you were like, what are we going to talk about today? I was like, I got a couple of good things. Yeah. I got one or two things, you know? Um, the... Uh, but yeah, the, the protein thing has never... I mean, it's early days for me, but it's never come up for me as an issue of like, um, you don't have some deep rooted, like innate sense that you're lacking protein in your body. No. And I, and I didn't do any protein powders or, um, you know, cause I was just like, no, that's processed food, you know? And I, and dude, I, I mean, I didn't do the plant-based thing out of like, you know, let me try this or this would be a good idea. I was fucking terrified. I was just like, I was like, I'm going to die. And I just see my uncle die in a horrible way. Where How old was, is he? Uh, 62, mm. you know, and he's my adopted sister's father. So she lost her father. Um, he, uh, and it was one of those things. It was just this horrible experience of him, like dying six times and coming back to life five. And the last time there was nothing left, you know, and then they had to make the decision to pull the plug. You know, and and this is a you know this is a, a young man with with children. Um, you know, I knew him my entire life. He was always there with us. You know, when we were kids, and he was you know, and some of the uncles were cool, and some of the aunts were cool, and other other ones weren't. And Ed was always like, "I God, I still have a letter that uh, that he wrote me when I was in graduate school that." I haven't been able to locate and it's such a mercy that I haven't been able to locate it. Cause I know when I find it, it will just make me, it will make me break mm-hmm. down, but it was so hard to lose Ed. And, and, and I knew, uh, without knowing much about diet and nutrition, I was like, dude, you're 60 pounds overweight. If you're having health issues, that's it, you know, or, or even if that's not it, losing that weight isn't, won't hurt. And it will probably help. You know, I feel like this is shit that's preventable. And, um, and so many people in my family um, are, you know, diabetic or pre-diabetic and overweight, mm-hmm. and you know, and, and that's and, and let's you know, let's be honest about this too. You know, I mean, so many people were like, you know, you know, you, you're, you know, you're a young guy. How could this happen to you? You're so skinny. I'm not skinny. I'm everybody in America is overweight. <laughs> I'm less overweight than a lot of the people that we know. Yeah, and you're a big dude and you can kind of, yes. you, you know, wear a baggy t-shirt and no one's going to say you're overweight. Exactly. It's not like exactly. you had a huge gut or anything like that. Yeah. And and also, it's like you're running all the time and you're running ultras. So yes, how dare you accuse me of this? But you can, you're a big you can dude. run ultras and yeah. still be overweight. And yeah. you definitely, how much have you lost? Because you're you're the trimmest that I've seen you. Uh, I'm, I'm probably down like 15 pounds. Mm-hmm. Um, I want to get down another seven or eight. Um and we'll see if that happens or not, you know. Um, but um, but I'm, I'm back running. There's a lot of, I mean, I have been, you know, since getting scared, I have been far more. And, you know, props to my girlfriend, Maddie, too. I mean, she's really been like, uh, you you got to take care of yourself. You need to, the, you can't do the things that you do without taking care of yourself. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know. But I, there's also, sorry, I don't mean to interrupt you, but I got to say this. Jump in. And we've talked about this before, but there is something deeply bred inside of you that prides yourself on, you know, your kind of rogue approach to lifestyle. Like you're, you're, you have an attachment, like in a romance, in, in the same way you romanticize your, your past drinking, mm-hmm. um, life. 
you kind of romanticize the beat up van and the, the crappy hotel rooms and the kind of lifestyle of, of the traveling road show, you know, mm-hmm. that you live. Yeah. And, and this is sort of requiring you to reexamine that and perhaps let go of, of that or at least not romanticize it. Yeah. I mean, I'm not saying change your, I'm not saying you're not going to go do the things that you love doing. I'm saying your, your, the pride that gets attached to like, I live this way, you know, like sort of in defiance, it's that rebel thing. Like I'm defying cultural norms and I'm going to live this way and fuck you. Yeah. I, I mean, part of it, you know, it, it, there's, it's a balancing act because part of it is, um, change and evolve and incorporate the the lessons that you learn in your life and respond to the wisdom that you're confronted with and also be true to yourself you know and i think you can do both of those things and i'm trying hard to do both of those things but um the yeah i mean i'm still playing out dramas from when i was a little kid of like you know young man you need to learn how things are done and i'm like no i'm going to i'm going to i'm going to do it my way and like that has served me and it has hurt me, you know, incredibly. And, um, so, I mean, let's put it this way though. You know, I, um, you know, I've been on the road a lot, you know, I'm in bars a lot. Um, I've, yes, I'm still the guy with, you know, both middle fingers in the air, but now I'm saying, uh, fuck you. You don't need to be drunk all the time to be a rebel. And, um, if you want to, if you want to smash the state, why don't you make sure that you have the tools to do it? Why don't you take care of the most important tools you have, which is yourself. If you want to change things, you know, the, um, the, I said this to a friend the other day and got shit for it, but I'll say it again. You know, the, uh, the most, the most, the most dangerous thing that we could do in America is have healthy black people. (laughs) Because, you know, poverty, malnutrition, and this system of, you know, government subsidies for meat and McDonald's and stuff like that, that being the only food that's available in low-income neighborhoods, um, you know, the do your best to stick around, be healthy for a long time, and be a pain in the ass for your enemies. You know, I, I really believe that. Well, let's flesh this out a little bit because, like, that's that's kind of a loaded statement to say i want to make sure i i understand you yeah the so i mean i come from sort of a a culture of uh of of resistance of pushing back against you know corporate america mainstream america mainstream ideals and um the but then within that the sort of punk rock community there's you know there's this there's the there's the idealist wing of like we need to change things women need to have an an equal say women need to have equal representation women need to have equal power um black people need to be allowed to own the places where they live and not white landlords and black tenants you know there is this stratification in america of um and it's and time and time again it's people of color who come out on the losing end um every time that the law is involved you know and so that so in the sort of punk rock community there's the like super idealist wing of like you know like let's change things let's move forward let's be progressive and then there's the sort of the other side that like the nihilist side of like anarchist um well not even anarchist of but like nihilist just like not even like let's go out and smash shit but let's just get fucked up Mm -hmm. you know and like real punk rock is like waking up and having you know a shot and a beer for breakfast and then like you know doing lines all day or whatever and um and a lot of people try to try to imagine that those are compatible things but when you're um when there is a culture of self-destruction of um of like oh we're just going to eat garbage and we're going to um you know we're not going to do what you tell us to we're not going to take care of our bodies Mm -hmm. um you don't have to there doesn't need to be a villain (laughs) because you're uh you're undermining yourself at every turn you know and if um if people you know there's a lot of 
a lot of musicians and comics with uh, with political aspirations and, you know, who are good at, um, you know, tweeting about shit. But um, but then in their own personal lives are um, are alcoholics or addicts are massively overweight. Our Ralphie May, mm-hmm. our, our friend Ralphie May just died at yeah, 45. Died. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And um, it's you know, that's the simple thing is that if you really want to if you want to fuck shit up, if you want to upend the existing balance of power, uh, be healthy. Right. So essentially like the, the sort of the punk rock of, of being held, we have, we, we live in a culture in which systems are erected that are inherently repressive to a lower socioeconomic class because healthy food is not accessible or affordable. Yeah. Right? And, and, and you can't co- use food country, stamps to buy a, healthy food. It's like, it's yeah. so it perpetuates and further entrenches the divide between the haves and the have nots, which of course is further, further repressing along. people of color yeah, and all of along, that. So falls along the color punk rock lines. thing is to, is to find a way to somehow, you know, transcend those erected cultural barriers that, uh, stand in between that person and being healthy so that you you can be physically healthy enough to stand up to the man and exactly for that's what you're saying exactly okay. i get that exactly <laughs> and i mean listen i i mocked the like vegan punks my whole life and i was wrong you know i was wrong do you want to apologize to jj right now <laughs> <laughs> i uh I, sh- I probably owe him a phone call. <laughs> <laughs> you should. John, I'm sorry. You were right. I was wrong. <laughs> I, I don't know. Yeah, you know, hear it. that's like, that's, that's a start, you know? So w- what about this testosterone thing? Oh, that's, uh, well, I mean, man, you think there's a lot of like weird, uh, feelings tied up, you know, and attachments to the word vegan. Uh, the testosterone is such a, I mean, I, I just instantly felt like ashamed you know, and when, and then when I sort of got over that and I was like, no, if, if I feel ashamed about this, I should just talk about it mm-hmm. with people because, um, and then it was, you know, it was sort of the, like, like the diabetes thing of, you know, people were like, oh, well, I, I never thought you would have a testosterone problem, you know, because I'm tall or because I have a deep voice or because I have hairy arms or, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like, or cause I make raunchy jokes or something like that. You know, I don't know what the. Um, it's weird how that gets tied into identity when it's really just a, you know, it's, it's, it's yeah. a biological, physiological, hormonal thing. Yeah. And, um, you know, one of the things I learned is that, you know, um, uh, libido is not just testosterone and testosterone is not just libido, you know? And when I was talking to my doctor, when, you know, when, when he said like, yeah, your testosterone is, is terribly low, um, I was like, really, you know, like, um, you know, I, I I still like, I can have sex and stuff. And he was like, well, are you depressed? And I was like, yes, I would like to die right now. And every minute of every day for the last 18 months, I would love Uh to die. Um, and he was like, well, yeah, that's, that is the first, um, the biggest, the most lasting manifestation of low testosterone is depression. Um, so did he put you on testosterone therapy or what is the protocol for addressing that? He tried that? to. Yeah. And I said, let me see if I can remedy it on my own. Um, so I haven't gone back in to get that retested. I'm going back to New York in December and I'm going to get that tested. I feel like it's rallying because I don't feel like dying every second of every day anymore. Um, and so I, I read a ton on... Um, testosterone's function and how it's um so if you testosterone is effective uh, or it helps building lean muscle mass and if you have lean muscle mass you have higher testosterone so um the the first thing that i did to uh to try and remedy my situation was i did like the five thousand squats in a month you know social media challenge and tried Mm -hmm. to rope a ton of my friends in to do five thousand squats with me because if you're going to do one simple exercise you can sort of do anywhere um squats are the best exercise and uh it's working the you know the biggest muscles in your body and that's what you need to work to uh 
um, to build test, you know, to build testosterone. Um, and I feel like that has, is that true? If you do, if you do like intense weight training that has a, uh, that will actually boost your body's natural ability to produce testosterone. Like, yes. I don't know enough about what, it. What, know. I mean, everybody feel free to fact check me and debunk this so we get good information but i've read stuff that point to points to old school like charles atlas strongman stuff the like uh deadlifts and squats and stuff like that the real gym rat shit um that stuff and then high intensity um you know interval workouts um helping to raise your testosterone so i've been doing the you know tabata um uh, the Tabata, Tabata stuff. I've been doing the squats and stuff. I haven't gotten a gym membership because I hate the gym, but I am going to get a gym membership and do that stuff. Um, and, uh, but I also, and this is my own extrapolation, but something tells me that when, you know, when I stop eating cheese fries and Cheetos and gummy bears and start eating cauliflower and asparagus and flaxseed and that that's not going to hurt my testosterone that right. it's going to help my testosterone. I don't think it's going to hurt your testosterone. <laughs> so you haven't, you haven't been back to that <clears throat> Polish doctor in, in Greenpoint since, no. he, since he delivered the bad news. Yeah, no, I, um, well, I mean, that's, that's the thing is that I like, I, I don't really live in New York yeah, anymore, but I that's know. where my health insurance is. So I, I have limited access to it. So I'm in that shitty gray area of like WebMD and, you know, in Google and like, well, I kind of feel, um, I, I, I definitely feel better. Um, I feel better mentally. I feel better physically. Um, I feel like it's on the upswing. I'll check back in, in December when mm -hmm. I get my results. Um, you know, I've been taking vitamin, I was vitamin D deficient. So I've been taking vitamin D, I've been taking zinc, um, Brazil nuts are supposed to be helpful too. Yeah. That's um, helpful with, uh, the selenium in them. It's, they have a high degree of selenium that supposedly has, uh, an impact on boosting testosterone. But I, an another really interesting thing was how, um, how insecure men are talking about testosterone and testosterone really? levels. Yeah. I, Why uh, do you bring it up? And you... Well, no, I, I posted something about it because I was like, this embarrasses me, so I'm going to post it. Because every time I've done something like that before, the response has been overwhelming. Uh -huh. And I had a bunch, of, a bunch of guys write to me um, saying, oh, yeah, my testosterone has been really low and it's been low for a long time. And, um, you know... And either they're just living with it or they're saying, you know, let, let, let us know how it works. Um, and you know, we'll try the same regimen and, um, the, uh, or yeah, I've been on hormone replacement therapy for four years, you know? And, um, you know, I talked to my dad, my, you know, my dad, um, you know, had a similar thing in, in his forties, you know, his, he had really low testosterone and, uh, and, you know, and he's been on hormone replacement therapy. Um, and I, you know, I, I guess a lot of guys are, I just, I'm 40, you know, and I'm, that seems to be too young to sign up for, because once you start taking it, you're on it for the rest of your life. Yeah. I mean, I don't know enough about it to speak intelligently, but it's frightening to, consider you know once you like you said like once you begin that like what is the long-term impact on your body's own native ability to produce that are you clamping down on that are you depressing it and <clears throat> and if you go off it can your body rebound and and take over or is are there long-term implications to that like i i don't know but yeah, it's, it's it, enough to ba like ba basically when you give me pause before yeah when you start replacing your body's it, like testosterone your body stops making its mm -hmm. testosterone so basically if you do hormone uh, what i understand is once you start down that road then that's it then you're on it you know for the rest of your life and um i i keep tiptoeing about around this and i hate it so i'll just come out with it I, i'm also taking fermented fish oil that was one of the mm -hmm. things that uh tim ferris said i was like i'm not gonna try and hack the diabetes thing i'm just gonna do the right thing and do plant-based 
Um, and the notable exception is uh, fermented fish oil. Which because is, why? Uh, Tim Ferriss had a his regimen for boosting your testosterone was uh, Brazil nuts, zinc, vitamin D, and fermented fish oil. And that's what I found in a panic. I was like, I'm going to do this and see if it works. You might want to, well, first of all, you got to, you got to be really careful about mercury levels in fish oil. Even the purest forms uh, have been found to be tainted. So you got to make sure that um, the brand that you're getting is mm -hmm. like top notch. And I would suggest that you might also uh, want to look at uh, Dr. Michael Greger's uh, nutritionfacts.org website has some videos about fish oil and the differences between fish oil and algal algae 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 based oils. Okay. Um, you might find that interesting. Okay. Yeah. I, I, I know that there's more research that I have to do, you know, and I, and like my methods of combating this are far from ideal, you know, cause it sort of was sprung on me. And then I just, yeah, but look know. at the, look at the, look at the changes that you've made in the last three or four months. I mean, that's pretty dramatic, dude. So don't undercut or undermine like yeah, you know, what yeah. you've done. Like, I think it's, I think it's amazing. I feel better. You know, I like mentally, I feel better. Um, physically I feel dramatically better. And, you know, I like to, to be able to run it, you know, I've had nagging issues and, um, with my, my right foot, my IT band, my hip, my back, you know, and I've been like trying to tackle all that stuff. And it, it's been a, it's been such a hassle and it's expensive. And I hate like, um, the guy who goes to the chiropractor three days a week, you know what? It's fucking working. It's working and it's totally worth it. You know, um, why, why did it take me so long to figure this shit out? You Cause know? you're a stubborn bastard, you know, <laughs> like we all are. Look, I always, yeah. I say it all the time. Like pain is the great motive. People are like, you know, what, what caused you to change? I was, dude, I was in pain. You yeah. Know? Pain it's and It's crazy terror. how these choices are available to all of us all the time. And yet it's so difficult to access them until, you know, we're at that breaking point. It doesn't yeah. have to be that way. That's just the way that, it, you know, it generally tends to work. And with someone as stubborn as you, like you're going to, you've got it. You've, you must've really been scared. Yeah. Yeah. I, um, you know, I mean, losing my uncle really helped, you know, um, it's, uh, that was heartbreaking. And that was also, I was like, okay this is what lays that, you know, behind door, door a, mm -hmm. if I don't do anything about this, that's where I'm headed, you know? And, um, and also, you know, I mean the, it's true that whatever, after 35, 40, like things start to slow down and it's harder to do the stuff that we did when we were younger. So does that mean you roll over and just, you're like, oh yeah, all right, I'll gain 40 or 50 pounds and like, let's Netflix and chill, you know, for the, you know, for, for another 30 years before I die or do you push back? Do you, do you turn and fight, you know? And do you say, no, this, I, I, I'm not, I'm not done being a human yet and having a full life. And, you know, I, I still got a ton of shit left to do, you know? Dude, you're only 40. As someone who's 10, 11 years further down the line, <laughs> you know, come on, man. Well, you know what? And, and I mean, I kept that in my head too, you know, that, you know, you and JJ, you know, that um, you guys are living huge lives right now, you know, and, and that's open to me. That's, that, that is an option, you know, and, and I, I got to like, just run towards that instead of running fucking Doug Stanhope. I love the guy so much. One of the smartest people I've ever met in my life. Motherfucker has aged like 30 years in the last 10. Uh, it makes me so angry. How old I, is he now? Uh, he's he's probably your age. Probably, yeah, I would he's imagine like 50 he's or 51, around, yeah, right something like there. that. Yeah. Yeah. For people that are listening that, that are maybe new to the show or don't know, you know, Doug Stanhope, super famous, amazing yeah. comedian who kind of inhabits this, counterculture sensibility in a, in, yes. a, in a sort of Hunter S Thompson kind of way, I suppose, yes. uh, you He's know, a hard, hard, yeah, hard partying, you know, fun loving, 
amazingly talented comedian and friend of yours. You've opened for him many yeah, he's times. He's a huge music. mentor. You've gone yeah. on the road with this guy. You've had crazy exploits pre-sobriety with yeah. him. And you still, do you still do gigs with him from time to time? And you I drop do, in on his crazy Arizona co- compound? We, we, we do gigs from time to time. And, um, and you know, like, we're, you know, the friendship is still alive. And like, you know, I still, whenever I finish songs and stuff, I send them to him and I, mm-hmm. I, you know, see him whenever I can, you know I mean? And I've had, you know, some of the, um, I shit on everything, you know, that's the way my brain goes, but there have been like, I've learned from Doug a couple of times, like on, you know, to be on the road playing a big theater, oh, there's 700 people there, you know, to just stay open and just soak it up and be like, yeah, these people are here to listen to me play my songs, my, you know, my songs that I started writing when I was whatever, 20 or something like that. And now, and now people know the words and it's so cool. Or like, you know, I played a gig in his like fun house, which is his bar in his backyard in Bisbee. And, right. uh, and th- like, that's a weird, you know, it's its own universe down there. Right? Yeah. Like, yeah. Has its own time zone. Yeah. It's really, it's another world, you know, but to be there with, you know, in a, in a room this size with, you know, 40 people like, you know, some of the, the smartest, most groundbreaking entertainers I've ever met. Some of my closest friends and to have them all know the words to my songs and to be there with them and to be a peer, you know, and to, uh, to see Doug, you know, out in the crowd, like singing along, you know, like a real smile on his face, not a sneer or a leer, you know, but just like happy. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, that's powerful shit, man. That is it's the good stuff. Yeah, but also to to not overly you know get caught up in the I'm sure there's a there's a there's a charisma like a, a tractor beam like a, a a center of gravity around a guy like Doug Stanhope that makes it very easy to kind of just fall into that orbit and stay there and start sort of mimicking, you know, his habits and Yeah. And and so to be able to be part of that but also erect your own boundaries around uh you know things that you do and don't do has to be tricky this that's one of the things i wanted to talk about today too is is the weird lives that we have like living in public and um expose you know exposing our foibles in public and to have to to be a public figure and, and toe a certain line and and you know people's expectations of us and um I've really struggled with that lately, you know, between because, um, because I'm friends with you and I admire you and I expect, you know, respect your work and because I'm friends with Doug and I admire Doug and I respect his work and people, you know, come to shows either having read the book or the long run or something like that, or heard me on the podcast and expecting me to be in that environment, the person who I am here. And then people who have heard just my songs on Stanhope podcast or the stories I tell on the Stanhope podcast, and they're expecting that person and your fans and Doug fans by and large are very smart and very fluid people. And they can, I think they're able to accept that I'm a whole person better than I am. I always feel like I'm disappointing people somehow, like I'm letting people down you know, and, um, because you feel like you have to be, you have to live up to a certain, uh, persona that other people you imagine you're projecting, you, you are projecting I'm, that they are projecting onto you. Yes. I'm projecting their projection. Yeah. yeah. And then I, and then I, that sounds like a lot of work. Yeah, man. I, it's <laughs> fucking tiring thinking yeah. about myself constantly. <laughs> yeah. Well, that is the great preoccupation of every alcoholic. Yeah, and this I is gotta where stop. this is I where just like, well, I could I could you know help you with a few sober tools that to enable you to tackle that a little bit. Yeah, but it's you know self obsession is at the center of alcoholism, right? And when you're caught up thinking about yourself and how you're being perceived and what do they think of me, um, <clears throat> then inevitably you're not the person that a you want to be or that they want you to be. They want you to be present and who you are. Yeah, yeah. People, just, you know. I think people want you there in the first layer. They want you to be the epithet that they understand you to be. So, you know, rich, the runner or the swimmer or rich, the triathlete or rich, the vegan, you know, and for me, they want me to be, you know, Mishka, the drunk or Mishka, the ultra runner or Mishka, the writer or whatever. But 
right past that layer is they just want you to be authentic. They want you to be a real person. They want you to be a real human being, you know? And I think it's always fascinating for us to find out that, um, oh, like Neil Young is really into model trains. And I, I, I love that detail. I, I love Neil Young. He's such a treasure. I celebrate that Neil Young is still alive and making records. That he's made a million records. And that he's such a weird guy that he's just like really into model trains. Tyler, he, Tyler saw him at the grocery store the other day. Oh, my God. I would have a hard time like holding myself back from just like just throwing myself at his feet and just, just tread on me. Yeah. <laughs> but the minute you're caught up in how am I coming off to this person is the minute that you stop being authentic. Right? So I, I, I wish I had remembered the name of the person who said this, but I just read something on Twitter that said, you know, like you, you write a thing or you make a song and then somebody tells you you're an artist and that's when the problems start. I just, somebody tweeted that the other day and I saw that. Who we got, that? we got to figure out who it is. I know, it's who was so, that? but it's, Oh, you so... know who I think it was? Yeah, I think it was Neil Strauss. Yes. That's, yeah. that's who it was. Okay, who I'm, I'm seeing later from... today, actually. Really? Yeah. Oh my God. Well, tell him. Do you know, are you a you fan of Neil's? I, I, I know nothing beyond that tweet. Oh yeah. No, um, he's Neil's amazing. But it, it's, it's totally true, man. Because you know, I, um, I get caught up in my head about shit, you know, about like, Oh, what are people expecting me to do? You know, or what, what song are my fans going to like? Well, fuck, fuck the fans. I need to write a song that I like. And if I like it, they'll like it. And if I think about them and try to write to them, I'll write a shit song no. because I'm, I, I'm not being authentic. I'm there's not, no, there's no question about that. You, you know? have to write from your heart. And as somebody yeah. who teaches writing at Yale, it's <laughs> shocking to me that you have to remind yourself of that. Well, you know, that's and, how it is though. Like we, yeah. we give advice for all this shit. And then as soon as we give yeah. the good advice, it like leaves our brain immediately. And then you're like, Oh man, I, yeah, I, no, I, I need to, I'm hungry. I need, I need to eat something. I need to they actually like practice I, the thing that I tell other people to do all day long. Yeah, there's, there's nothing worse than having to take your own advice. And on that subject, like how is the writing going? I want to talk about this, man. I, I feel like, and I'll just put, I'll put the cards on the table. Mm -hmm. My personal opinion, and, and maybe this is like unfair judgment or whatever, but I can't, I can't help it. I feel like you're a, you're a very good musician. You write beautiful songs. You obviously love everything about touring and performing and the feedback that you get from, from doing it live. But I think your gift is writing. And I, I feel like. And please tell me if I'm way off base on this. I feel like at times, perhaps the touring is a distraction from doing the thing that scares you, which is sitting down and looking at a blank page. My writing is currently frozen in carbonite, like Han Solo in The Empire Strikes Back. The, uh, I'm, glad, I'm glad you, you uh, we pulled that back to The Empire Strikes Back for, an, for a callback. Um, my book flopped, and that was incredibly painful to me. Um, I it, still it, it flopped only in terms of how many people purchased it. It yes, didn't flop yes. as well and, as a work that you're not proud of or that doesn't have merit. So no, and that and that and that to me makes it worse. Which is that every time I open it and I go back and look at the at the book and and I'm like, I did it. I, I, I really, I wrote a great book and I'm so proud of this. And every person who's ever read it has come up to me and been like, man, I, I, I love the book, you know, and it, it's been so meaningful to people and they come to shows and they bring their copies that are all tattered and, you know, that they've brought everywhere with them and, or people buy extra copies to give to their friends. And like that it has whatever 4.8 stars on Amazon, you know, it, it's been, but, um, my publisher did not represent my interests well and they did almost nothing to promote the book and it was lost in the shuffle and uh that i mean i'll be honest about it that was crushing for me that was incredibly painful and um and you know and i mean and i did dude i and I, you know i owe you an apology for this i feel like at that time in my life leading up to the book i leveraged every friendship i had to do everything i could to get the word out about the book yeah and but that's what you do i was you, it, and myopically the, and focused on that you know and you don't i feel have to like, apologize to me for that i mean that's what you have to do you have to be your own entrepreneur you have to be your own marketing team and and you know you can say like well the publisher is supposed to do all those things but ultimately that that responsibility falls on your shoulder so i don't begrudge you that at all i wouldn't done this it's what you have to you yeah. have to get very unabashed and unashamed when you have a book coming out and you got to throw yourself into all that i didn't i didn't think twice about that i was happy to 
put a microphone in front of you. Okay. I love the book. You know, I can't say enough good things about it. If people are new to this podcast and haven't checked it out, I swear I'll make it up to you. You should all purchase it. Well, right, there <laughs> we fi finally got yeah, some product we, placement. Yeah. In now the, we know why you're here today. <laughs> but uh, no, I mean, I love the book, man. And I think, and I, and I hear you and I know, and you know, I, I can only imagine what that felt like, but you know, at least intellectually that the solution to that is to just start writing the next thing, yep. you know? Yep. And, and when you take that break, it gets harder and harder. Yep. To get um, back to it. All right. So I'm going to outsource my motivation, which is, which is something I've gotten really good at. So we're going to, we're going to do this. Um, the month of November, uh, I'm going to write every single day. <laughs> if you could see his face right now, should we create a hashtag? Uh, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll come up with a hashtag for Mishka when writes. the, uh, and please everybody join me, whether you're a writer, or you're not a writer, like let's all please write, just sit down, turn your phone off for half an hour, 45 minutes, an hour every day, do it every single day for the month of November and something will happen. Uh -huh. And I, and it's time I put it. Yes, you're absolutely right. I mean, you're calling me out and thank you. And that's why I'm here is to like, cause you understand and you get it. Yeah. And that's exactly what I'm doing. I've been, mm -hmm. I've been, listen, I mean, I, I also, I did, you know, I did a live record that went to number two on iTunes on the comedy charts. You know I mean? I like, I have a live show now that is, that did not exist a couple mm -hmm. years ago. I have a ton of new songs that all counts, but I'm not writing. And that counts too. Mm -hmm. And I'm, and I'm hiding from it cause I'm scared cause I feel like I'm out of shit. I feel like I'm out of ideas, you know, and I don't know what the next thing is. And, but I'm, the only I'm, way to solve that is to begin the process of writing. And it's not about publishers and book agents or what other people think or sales or any of that. It's about your relationship with yourself and the written word. And I think for you to not be writing is for you to, um, is, is for you to betray not just the gift, but yourself. Yeah, you're totally right. You know, I mean, I, um, I'm guilting a friend of mine into writing a memoir. And one of the things that I told him is that, um, not everybody can do what, what you can do, what we can do this gift of stringing words together and having it create meaning or create it, create a story or to be able to write a page and have somebody else read that. And then they can be in the same room that they, that we were in it, in our head, feeling what we felt. And, um, and even if it's not inspirational, even if it's incredibly depressing, just that experience helps because for them to read it, they're like, Oh, another person felt what I felt. Or there is another person in the world. I need to practice empathy. Mm -hmm. I need to practice compassion. I need to know that I'm, you know, that communicates to us that we're not alone. You know, writing shows us that other people exist, you know, and that there are other worlds out there and other lives. And, um, yeah, I just need to suck it up and just like, I've been licking my wounds about it for as long as I can. And, uh, and it's time, yeah. you know, to just try again. And you can't, you can't transmit something you haven't got so you can't try to convince some friend of yours to write a memoir or get up in front of students at yale and tell them how to do this or that if you're not doing it yourself there is an inauthentic inauthenticity to that yeah. and a disconnect that you need to resolve and it will make you a better <clears throat> it will make you a better teacher yeah. it will make you a better writer it'll make you a better servant but i think that there's some dissonance uh you know, in yourself right now around this issue. And if you can heal that and resolve it by just committing to the page and showing up for it without, without knowing what that's going to look like, I think that is a huge, uh, also a huge part of your healing process that goes hand in hand with these other things that you're doing to be more gentle to yourself and your health. Yeah, you're right. I mean, it's time for, I, you know, I went out there and like beat myself up in every regard, you know, physically, mentally, emotionally. And like, while I'm fixing my back and fixing the chronic pain issues that I've had so I can run again, fixing my health, like while I'm on this health kick, it makes sense to, to do that for my brain as mm -hmm. well and get back to, uh, you know, just, uh, just a, that little daily workout of, you know, putting the, you know, pen to the page for an hour a day. I mean, I think that's, um, I, I don't know. I think it'll, I, I think it will totally change. I know it'll totally change where I am in my head. If yeah. I can do that for I an hour a day. Um, 
The uh, one of the other things I've started doing, and you'll get a big kick out of this, is that I've been speaking at high schools about uh, drug and alcohol use Have and you? abuse. Yes, and right. and give me the pitch and how to succeed and how to how to fail. Uh huh. Um, I mean, one of the things is that I think we know now that to uh, to preach abstinence to kids is not going to work because they're smarter than that and they have access to information. They know that we drank or we partied or, you know, we, um, you know, abstinence, uh, uh, abstinence based sex education has been proven to be like a universal fit. That's a great way to have a kid <laughs> when you're 16, yeah. you know? And, um, so I just approach it as a, as a time management thing that, um, all of you, have things to do with your life. You have big things to do, whether you want to be an MC, whether you want to be a model, whether you want to be the president, whether you want to make a million dollars, you want to build apps, you want to build cars, you have stuff to do with your life. So when you're hanging out with your friends and somebody's like, yo, I got a bottle. You want to go hang in the park and drink the bottle? Just say, no, I got stuff to do because you have stuff to do. And whatever you're trying to do with your life, alcohol will be an obstacle. It will absolutely, it, it'll, it'll prevent you from doing whatever it is you need to do, whatever it is you have to do. Um, and, uh, do you share your own personal story? Oh yeah, that? absolutely. You gotta like get them to relate to you. By yeah. It. Yeah. The, the tattoos go a long way mm -hmm. with the kids, you know, they, um, you know, but I, I, I tell them about, you know, just how, um, you know, I like couldn't even get a job as a bar back when I was 32 and I was like working off Craigslist and doing, you know, just about nothing, you know, and then now, you know, I did 145 shows on the road last year in five different countries. Um, you know, I had a live record come out, uh, went to number two on iTunes. I have two more records I'm working on right now. You know, one's almost done. Uh, the next one will be done a couple of months. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm an ultra runner. You know, I had, you know, six best selling Kindle singles. I, you know, I wrote a good book. Um, none of that would have happened if I was still drinking. No. You know, um, we wouldn't be here. No. And, uh, you know, so, and, you know, and also I tell them to, um, to embrace their failures, you know, and, and say that, um, failure is a necessary ingredient for success, you know, and that, that, and, um, every failure is actually a step forward, you know, and then that's, that's how you learn, mm -hmm. um, to be who you are and, and what you're going to do with your life. And, um, failure is such a terrible word. I know, I know it's, uh, you know, we got to sort of like reclaim it somehow, yeah. but that's the word that people understand, you know, that, um, it's, you know, I, it's, I, I call it uh, what failing forward, you know, that it's, you know, you're not, um, it's not a mistake, like you didn't, you didn't do a take wrong. It's, it's a, just a take, right? You know, it's a try, try again. You know, I like that. I like that. I mean, usually the stand in is learning experience, you know, yeah. but that's still, that seems kind of like weird. That's like a, well, I think that's, that's a like consolation prize. You yeah. Know? Well, in learning experience, those are two words that you've heard together so many times that they start to lose their meaning. Mm -hmm. So I think you have to sometimes, especially with kids, you have to say the same thing in different language. Um, but I'm uh, I'm speaking to some juvenile offenders in a couple of days. Oh wow! So it's good that we're doing this. I got to. I of course I haven't looked at my notes. Yeah, yeah. I have to sort of rehearse my pitch and uh, you know and figure out what it is. I'm going to. That's do. cool, man. That's got to be gratifying and oh, and fun dude, to do. it's awesome. Yeah. I mean the uh, the most rewarding thing that I do now is uh, is teaching and is uh, talking to people. Mm -hmm. You know and and you realize that that's service right? That's giving back. Yeah. And, and, and what is the, you know, what is the impact of doing that? Like being engaged, we, you know, we talked about self-obsession earlier, like the best way to transcend your self-obsession is to be in that service role, whether it's teaching or getting up in front of kids or whatever, because it gets you outside yourself and your little microcosm of problems and all of that. And the feeling that you get in the wake of that is priceless. Yeah, dude, I, I never feel uh, more exhausted and more elated than I do when uh, when I'm at Yale, when I'm teaching. Because uh -huh. that takes, 
that takes all of my CPU, mm-hmm. you know, because a lot, you know, a lot of times in class it's, you know, it, it, we're, you know, it's nonfiction writing, writing about your life. And so everybody comes with some trauma that they've survived, that they're trying to use writing as the tool to work through that trauma, um, to move forward. And that's exactly what you and I did, you know? And, um, so I have to, you know, sort of shepherd them through this stuff. And a lot of times it's a, it's like above my pay grade. It's, you know, it's just, it's more than like, I don't know the answers. I don't know how to comfort them. I don't know how to guide them. And sometimes it's just like, I'm here for you. Right. You know, like in, give me an example of that. Um, rape. There's, you know, always a woman or several w- women in my class who have, you know, endured being raped. But your, jo- was- your, your job isn't to be their psychiatrist. It's your right. job is to help them figure out how to translate that that emotion into onto the page. Yes, absolutely. And I do, and I do try to draw a hard line at the, you know, in the opening of the class between like, I I'm here to teach you writing Mm -hmm. and I'm going to do my best to teach you writing, but also I'm a human being. So when I see somebody in pain, who's struggling with something, I'm always, you know what I mean? I'm always trying to provide them with the tools to move forward. And there are some things that I just don't, I don't know how to help them through it. Right. You know, um, you know, there was a woman who, uh, who lost her son, like 20 year old son to an overdose, you know, nothing more unnatural than a parent losing a child. And, um, you know, so that's, that's always challenging. Um, it's exhausting. I mean, after Yale, I have to sleep for like three days cause yeah. I just, I'm so fried, but it's so good, man. It's, it's a real privilege to be able to, to be in that position yeah. to try and help people. Do they let you wear the Hot Wheels hat when you teach? Hell yeah, dude! I'm the I'm the I'm the dirty rock and roll teacher. Like they would be disappointed if I didn't, you know, if I didn't show up in like the van falling apart and like blasting Guns and Roses or whatever. I know. know. Well, this is like part of the identity that you're holding on to, right? So this this Hot Wheels hat, I think that's a replacement from the original. No, one, dude, but this is, is that the same one? This is the same one from like you had one. that same hat like when I first met you. I don't think I've ever been with you when you were not wearing the Hot. Hot Wheels hat. It smells like a foot, dude. It's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's bad news, dude. What is it about that hat? It's my hat. But what is you it know, like? Why that hat? Um, I don't know. I just I like uh, the drummer of my old band used to wear hats like this, and uh, I was like, oh, it's a good hat. I should get one of those. And my hair started to thin, and then I was like, all right, now I need to rock that hat all the time. But I was like, I don't want to just be one of those guys with like the generic. I was like, it's got to be a little personalized. And uh-huh. I found the Hot Wheels patch. I got my mom to sew it on for me. And oh, so you didn't buy that hat. You actually made this it. This is one of a kind, dude. All right, I have this like a little the... bit more appreciation for it then. Yeah. So when you get up and, you know, day, day one, first day of class at Yale and you get up and, and, you know, I would imagine you're wearing a short sleeve shirt. You see the tattoos. You got the Hot Wheels hat on. Yeah. Do you wear shoes? Uh, I do. Wear I wear shorts. I wear Vans. I, I try to wear jeans as much as I can bear it. You know, when it's when it's not too hot. It is sort of like Bill Murray <laughs> in like you know, uh, Meatballs era Bill Murray. Uh, you know, teaching a writing course. You know, Bill Murray in the Robin Williams role in Dead mm-hmm. Poet Society. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's good, man. Well, cool, dude. I think we gotta uh, we gotta close it down here. Awesome, you awesome. Know? This is a good one. See, I knew we had. There was plenty to talk, to talk about. Yeah, man. Why did we always... wait a year and a half? It's me. It's me. Is I've it? been, yeah, I've been busy. You're I've been overseas. everywhere. I've been scattered. I've been, yeah. What's next? You going um, on the road again? How's living in Atlanta? I mean, I'm not really there much. Um, my apartment's the fucking bomb, dude. It's crazy. I have two bedrooms and two bathrooms. It, it was like, you're a living miracle. <laughs> it just feels You're like a miracle of sobriety. It just feels like op- American opulence. And you've, you've, you been with your like, gr- you've been with Maddie, your girlfriend, for two years now? A uh, year and a half, something like half. that. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Is that the longest relationship you've ever had? Uh, sober. Yeah. yeah. It's the longest relationship I've ever had man. sober. Yeah, she's the best. She's awesome. She's, she, you know, she's really she's full of surprises. Cool. Thanks for doing this, man. Dude, thanks so much for having me back. It's All right. Mishka Shubali is easy to find the internet at Mishka Shubali on yep. Twitter and Instagram. And that's where I'll make it up to you. You got all the Kindle singles. You can find all that. And stuff we'll have a Amazon. hashtag for the November writing challenge. Uh, we should decide that the, now. What are we going to do? Um, 
Hashtag Mishka rights. Well, it Why can't not? be about me. It's got to be about us. It's okay. got to be RRP rights. RRP rights. Is that too long? But then, it, no, it is about you, dude, because this is a challenge to you. It, it's a reminder to you, I think. You're doing it as a group thing, but uh, Mishka, I just feel it. I don't know, dude. Like now I feel the pressure. Yeah. And we're yeah. Have dead radio air here trying to figure <laughs> it out. So, you know what? We'll, we'll, we'll decide off mic and yes. then I'll put it in the intro and the outro and I'll put it in the awesome. show notes. And we'll do I, that. um, I have to, I should have shown it to you before too, but I have to show it to you when we get out of here. I have the guitar that was made for me by a ritual podcast fan, uh, Carl Adams in the UK. And he arranged to have this beautiful guitar made for me. Uh, th- with uh, Primal Roots, his company, and it's the it's the elephant. I saw a picture this. of that. It's That's fucking amazing, dude. It's gonna wow. blow your mind. You yeah. didn't bring it with you. It's in the uh, it's in the trunk of the car. I'll show it to you when we're done here. Oh, cool. There's a guitar behind you. Did you tune that thing? Uh, yeah, it's almost tuned. Do you want to do you want to take us out with a little something? Uh, yeah. Let me give it a shot. Yeah, let's do it. Mm. All right. So uh, Mishka's gonna take us out. What's the song called? This song is called. Uh, you are the song. You are the song. Peace plants. Namaste. Try that again. You are the load in the sleepy sound engineer. You are the green room carpet, the stale smell of beer. You are the lingering presence as the sun died in the room. You were the drink tickets. You were the food. Scowling at the band You were the laughing bingo ladies You were the hostile doorman You were the karaoke bros Passing one idea around You were the prettiest girl In this goddamn one muscle car town You were the words, you were the beat, the melody, the song. Now you're everywhere, now that you're gone. You were the poorly ground. Microphone chalk in my mouth. You were the crowd getting restless as the show headed south. You were the shithead talking trash from the bathroom line while I was tearing my fucking heart out in three, four time. the words, you were the beat, the melody, the song. Now you're everywhere, now that you're gone. You were the ashtray in a non-smoking room. You were late check out in the early afternoon You were something I've been chasing my whole wretched life Something that won't let go of me no matter how hard I try 
You are the words, you are the beat, the melody, the song, yeah. You are the words, you are the beat, the melody, the song. Now you're everywhere, now that you're gone. Now you're everything, now that you're gone. You're everything, everywhere, now that you're gone. Thanks, brother. Another classic.